Hello everybody and welcome back once again to the Biff Rugby League podcast. Unfortunately, obviously last week we couldn't get a podcast out because Discord decided it was going to crash. We couldn't get recorded in time, we just had no no time to to get it all done before the fix, before the game on Thursday night, which is obviously when we decide to put fixtures out, well, put the podcast out before the latest round of fixtures. Another apology is from Robin this week. Unfortunately, he cannot make it once again. Um, he's got loads of um, exams to study for and stuff this week, so we've let him have another week off. He has provided us with a story of the round, which is a really interesting one as well, and he, he'll provide us with uh, um, his set of sixes, which you'll see put up on another uh, graphic on Twitter uh, just before or just after this podcast is released. Um, but first of all, Toby, how are you? How was your, well, for the listeners and, and the watchers, how has your last fortnight been? Yeah, it's not been too bad. It's been great to have uh, it's been great to have Super League back and the NRL's coming back soon and now it's, I genuinely can't believe how much rugby league we have on at once and I'm a bit I can't believe that it's something that last you know, it feels like we're in back in the swing of it and it's hit me out of nowhere. So Yeah, it's good to have get... to have so much rugby back, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. As I say, it was. I thought I was doing a good job of keeping on top of seven championship fixtures a week, and now so much more to keep on top of. But it's good fun. Yeah, well, I mean, we we love it. We've been sat down. We've watched games on a Monday night. We've chatted about games over a weekend. We've all been to. I think we've most of us have been to a live game this season already. I, mean, I don't know if you've managed to get yourself to one, but we will be soon. We'll all be at live games at the same time on a weekend and be able to just talk about them. And, and that links perfectly into to Robin's, well, the story of the round for this week that Robin provided us. It was going to be last week's story of the round as well, but after the viewing figures that we saw this week on Channel 4 and the way Premier Sport have been performing over the last few weeks, the importance of the televised fixtures, whether it be on Channel 4 or Premier Sports or Sky or The Sportsman or Our League or BBC Sport, like, I was saying, that's six different platforms over the last like five weeks. It's been absolutely outstanding and before I go into some of the numbers, it's it's so good to see the, the paywall being knocked down by the likes of Channel 4 and, and BBC Sport happily going out there and just promoting the game and having the game on and promoting it all over Twitter as well as the, the platforms as themselves, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, obviously some of it will be people interested in a sport they probably haven't seen much of before. Um, although, you know, they've about seen Challenge Cup through BBC, the fact that it's the actual Super League um, at the start of the season. So I don't know, obviously, if the viewing figures at the moment are something that might tailor, uh, tail off to, uh, you know, not not much, that much, mm. sort of more average as the season goes on. But it's um, it's been absolutely fantastic to see, um, you know, rugby league, that you can watch a three to four game for free, not for free, but without using a traditional mm. broadcast provider. Yeah. Um, that you know for what rugby league normally has in this country, and that is just really excellent. Um, as I was thinking, I was saying last night while we were watching uh, Dude Be Witness, that um, it, I've actually found myself knowing more about the championship so far this season. I'm equally, um because of that sort of regular Monday night coverage and that's just excellent so really happy with sort of all the coverage so far but especially Channel 4 uh, the interest they've managed to create um, and I think the time slot they've used the 12th day on Saturday is a really effective mm. time slot by the looks of it too so excellent stuff so far Yeah, before I said uh, before I mentioned the viewing figures and the actual numbers the, the peak audience for round 2 was up 117% on that usual spot at that time not including round like not on round 1 so the fact that the viewing figures are 117% more at between 12:30 and 3 o'clock on a Saturday lunchtime on channel 4 goes to show how many how many people actually watch rugby league and how many people are probably watching rugby league because it's free than what they are on sky the Channel 4 partnership is, is outstanding. You've got Adam Hills as your main presenter, Warrington Wolves PDRL player, Danica Prim, Leeds Rhinos and England women's prop forward. Sam Tompkins is on there as a player that Robin, I know, is a massive fan of. You've got Leon Price, an old school, like, I think he's won Man of the Matches in Grand Finals, if not Challenge Cup Finals, multiple trophies, played for Great Britain, played for England. You love... Um, is it Mark Wilson on the commentary on Channel 4 
depending on who he's got with him. Um, like it, it, outstanding Kyle Amor was absolutely outstanding in the first week back for them. They've got Helen Skelton as their pitch side reporter, the wife of Richie Myler. It's the way they brought it all together seems to have worked really well. And they're sharing commentary teams with the likes of the Sportsman and Our League and the BBC, which is, is really good to see. Round one, the average audience was 630,000. And round two was 515. Like you said, a slight drop off. But I think that was mainly because like the storm that we'd had the week before, people that might not have had access to Channel 4 because of a storm might genuinely might not be able to watch it just because of that very reason. And we have to take that into consideration a little bit as well. But to see it outside the payroll, to see it on Channel 4, the first time it's been on terrestrial... Well, the first time Super League has been on free-to-air TV ever. I think I don't think it's ever been on free-to-air TV ever before. And... I know Robin thinks that after the two-year period, could we could we see more games on Channel Four over a weekend? And would you like to see more games on on Channel Four over a weekend? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the broadcaster who currently um, holds the Super League rights just—I I mean, I, I don't like any of. I don't. I just don't like them as a broadcaster. So for me, it's fine. I, although they've got a close partnership with Channel Four that's enabling this, it's uh, it's excellent, and I think it's. When you look at the back foot that rugby league's on in terms of its popularity compared to domestic, you know, the Premiership rugby union compared to, of course, football, um, and even compared to something like American football in terms of viewership figures, um, I think there's almost a cry out to make rugby league the sport you could watch without paywalls. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm interested. I think also. Something to consider, just in regards to the um, the sort of viewing figures being slightly less, is that the game, the first round of the League Warrington game was that was a close game at half time. It was a close mm. game at the finish, where Saints ran away with the game pretty much from the off against uh, Hull FC uh, in round two, and I think that could have affected sort of your average viewing figures towards the end. And it is something that, as we talk more about Super League, I have been a little bit disappointed with sort of the. The, diff, the side, the gap in points between um, teams in in some of the scores we've had already when it's around the season. Um, but I, I think that if you get games like Leeds Warrington on every every Channel Four game, then we're really asking, um, we're really going to put uh, the decision makers under pressure when it comes to where to take Super League for the future in terms of a TV partner. Yeah, hundred percent. The peak audience for that that first round game between Leeds and Warrington was seven hundred thirty five thousand, like towards in the final minutes of the game, nearing nearly seven hundred fifty, I believe. We've and figures have been between seven hundred thirty five and seven hundred fifty thousand for the last few minutes of that game. Like you said, the Saints Hull FC game wasn't as close towards the end of the game. I found myself watching the game, but probably flicking on my phone at the same time because the game was finished, so I was only sort of listening in people might have just turned it off and flicked something else on or if they've gone to the shop they've they've decided oh this game's finished I might I might go and have a shower or whatever before I go out or whatever but if you're interested if the game is entertaining you're going to sit there and you're going to carry on watching it and I think that the fixtures that they've got and the fixtures that they have chosen are the are the good quality fixtures and the fixtures that should give us good quality games we're getting the same on Premier Sports as well the last night's game between uh, Dewsbury and Widnes was really good the game between Featherstone and Lee was pretty good as well at the start of the season. Like we've got another one this weekend between Witness and Lee. It'd be the third time Lee are on in five weeks. That might be a little bit some, something that they might have to look at. Maybe don't you don't you feel? But the quality that they do, they've got a segment where they go and buy food at half time and they rate it. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Like I've not seen anyone do that really on on live TV on live sport. I think that's a nice little touch to add as well. Yeah, I mean, it's been, you know, they've just created talking points um, uh, outside, you know, on top of um, what's going on on the pitch. And they've, they've kept people interested. And I think that we've seen some great personalities on Punditry. And it's been, yeah, it's been really positive. So, I mean, long may it continue, hopefully. And we'll see what happens from here. Yeah, long may it continue. We've got more televised games 
this weekend. I don't know what I think. We've got eight NRL trial games, three Super League games, and three Challenge Cup games. That that takes us to fourteen games of rugby league on telly. Whether that's free, whether it's on Sky, whether it's on Premier Sports, and you have to pay a little bit more. That's outstanding coverage across the board. And I can't wait for more. We're going to get a lot more games as the season goes on, I'm sure of it. And potentially next year, we're going to have more games televised than any other game, than any other season ever in the history of, of Rugby League since since the Super League was put behind a paywall. And, and, and that's, what, nearly 30 years ago now. So we can't knock it at all. But we must move on. We've got two weeks of Super League action to catch up on. I've got the league table up in front of me. Five teams have won two out of two. Five teams haven't won a game at all. And then you've got... Catalan and Hull FC have won one game, one loss, and a lost lost the game. Has anyone surprised you? Whether it's a player, whether it's a, a a team, have they surprised you because in a good way or a bad way so far this season? I think Wigan have been the biggest surprise to me in terms of I really wasn't sure how they were going to go. Um, didn't think they'd strengthen. They'd strengthened on last season. Didn't think they'd necessarily got worse either. They'd made a call that was a risk in terms of head coach. Not that any sort of new head coach is a risk, but this one was somebody who'd never done it at top level before as a head coach, um, which for a team the size of Wigan, you know, is, is sort of un, unheard of. Mm. And then they've played absolutely outstanding against Holkar and Leeds to be able to to have their two wins from two. From two. Yeah. Um, similarly, I would sort of say the same for any of the teams who have got two wins from, from two so far um, in terms of you know Huddersfield have looked dominant Warrington um, look like they fight until the end at the moment under Daryl Powell uh, Daryl Powell um, the two sort of if we talk about teams that have lost Wakefield have had have managed to keep their scores really close yeah. I don't know whether that that start of the season play or whether Willie Folks has really got something good going on there um, really happy to see Max Jowett play well um, against Catalans, actually. That was a good performance. Because um, I, I think he's somebody who I, I've i wanted to be the Wakefield starting fullback for many seasons. And a lot of the time. It's injury that's sort of got in the way of him being able to do that. Um, and then Leeds said in the predictions ahead of round one mm. that... Um, I don't think Leeds will get like last season. I thought Leeds were going to look really good. They didn't come out of the blocks fast, and it seems like the same is happening to them again, where they're going to lose three or four games to start off, and then playing Catalans next week, um, and then they're probably going to sort of maybe start to pick up the wins later in the season, um, which is quite a. Uh, it sort of seems like last season beating itself a little bit for Leeds. Yeah. So, yeah. We said this as well, didn't we? Said, it, is, is it the Leeds team that's the problem? Or is it potentially Richard Agar's type of game management? And we haven't quite figured out what style of rugby they want to play. They've been hit with quite a few injuries early on. Uh, they've had to, to shuffle around and that's never good. And they're not the only team to have been hit with injuries. Um, I, think, I believe Catalan got hit with injuries. Three front row forwards out. Well, two bands and, and a broken arm. So they're going to be three true front row forwards out for a good four, five, six weeks, like until they get those three players back in Dudson and Na and Dylan Napa and Julian Busquet, they're going to really struggle up front. And you say they've got Leeds coming up next. Leeds need a win next weekend, or where well, they need a win in the Challenge Cup, maybe to just to boost. Sorry, they need a win in order to boost their performances before they get into the Challenge Cup, and they've, their fixtures come a bit thicker thick and fast because Leeds might not be focusing for a playoff or uh, for a grand final but they might want a really good cup run but they're going to need to have form in order to compete in both and a win this weekend against Catalan is probably going to be really vital for them we're going to move down to the bottom of the table Le Leeds are, and Wakefield two losses from two we've mentioned them Wakefield only six points minus six points difference two really close defeats they look like they're on the up a little bit we hope they're on the up a little bit we predicted them to finish bottom but it looks like Toulouse could finish bottom. They're already on minus 54 points difference. No Mark Carella, no Jonathan Thought Ford. Two key players for them. Like that's a surprise. Like Mark Carella came out and said, I'm I'm ready to play. And Sylvan Hulez has gone, he'll never play for Toulouse again. Like something something's going on there, and I'm not really quite sure what it is. 
Yeah, it's really disappointing. Um, you know, I, I mean, the reason I think we got to lose at eleventh was because of how exciting a player Mark Carella is. Mm. How exciting, um, how exciting a player like. I'm just trying to read through the squad and pick they've got, out. They've got Tony Gijo in there. They've got. Um, James Cunningham, Lucas Alvear in there. They've got uh, Lloyd White, I think, yeah. playing at nine. So they haven't got a bad team, but it's not. There's players in there who I want to get excited, you know, who yeah. I was I'm excited to see. Um, and I think that's it. I didn't really have that in Wakefield outside of Tom Johnston, probably. Yeah. But now it seems like they're exciting players, just that aren't going to be part of the team. So. I see. I, th- I think I see. I saw on the highlights one of their games that Gijo seemed really frustrated um, with how the team sort of playing. Um, yeah, I mean Tony Gijo. Yeah. Tony Gijo is a Super League level player. We know he is. He you saw the performance he put in for Catalan at the Challenge Cup final when they won the Challenge Cup. The way that he's, the way he led that Catalan's team as as their number one guy. It was just a shame to see his Catalan career sort of fizzle out and then move to Toulouse, and it was really odd that move and. I'm surprised he didn't get picked up by another Super League team that needed a fullback at the time. Arguably Wakefield when they had Rocky Hampshire <laughs> and like players playing out of position. Going to Cass now, the Tigers under Lee Radford. Doesn't look very promising. Like you said, he looks like he's brought in a Hull FC side and it wasn't working for him at Hull like three well, two years ago when he was when he was sacked after like I think mid game, he was sacked mid game and Adam Pearson came to do the the TV interview and it was a bit odd no one really knew what was going on because it wasn't announced and then Pearson came down and, and whatever but it hasn't been the best of starts for 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 Radford at the, at the Cast Tigers has it? No it's really not I thought this was going to be his sort of comeback and his you know okay he thinks was out at whole but I've had this time to look at the game see where I needed to improve my coaching and, and move from there really doesn't seem like it happened um, it's interesting I think because what I've mainly seen is players who are in this cast squad, squad who we really like three years ago mm. aren't performing at a level which we want them to be able to perform at um, you know I think I've seen quite a lot of um, negative comments about the performance of Jake Truman against mm. Warrington on Thursday yeah um, it's it's but it's also there's some error going on with the coaching here, um, and I'm not sure where it's going wrong. But it just seems like Lee Ruff has hit that point where he just can't he can't coach in the top level anymore. Yeah, that the Hull FC side that won two Challenge Cup finals back to back was was unbelievable but I remember speaking to someone at the time and he said they're all his like mates they're all Radford's boys and the only reason they were playing well was because they were playing under Radford but then then his system just began not working and people had figured out how they were playing and he's probably he looks like he's gone into cast and he's decided to play the same way and, and bring some of his mates with him but I hope that they can turn it around at the minute it looks like we're going to have the top six and the bottom six and they are just going to be those six teams will keep winning these six teams will will not win and yes we'll, we'll have our few in the middle but we kind of hope that Toulouse can turn it around we hope that Wakefield and Leeds and Cass can all turn it around but then we're getting teams like Salford and, and Hockey are two losses from two they made the semi-finals last year I don't know if that's because they haven't improved their squad massively well Lachlan Coote their big star signing he's out injured now for, a, for the foreseeable I'd, I've not seen how long for but then you're looking at Salford Two wins from two. Mark Sneed's got four Man of Steel points now. Brody Croft's playing outstandingly well. Ken Seo has got five tries in in two games. These guys are. We weren't sure. I think we put them tenth or even ninth in our prediction, and we've looked at them and gone, they don't look great. But Sneed's come in brand new. Croft's come in brand new. Ken Seo's still flying high getting four tries against Toulouse in awful conditions at the weekend are they are they going to be a dark horse this year are they are they going to try and push for do you reckon they, they can keep that up and push for a playoff spot do you know what it's been incredible so far how well they've played I've seen 
Ryan Briley, Ken Seo, Tim Lafay, Joe Burgess, Brody Croft, and Mark Sneed, all backs and half backs. Not even talking about the forwards. I've mm. seen all of them breaking through tackles, accelerating unbelievably well for so especially someone like Mark Sneed. He scored a brilliant try where he just sees a gap and runs for it. Yeah. Um, which I wouldn't say we're really used to seeing Sneed do um against Blues. And they're all like the 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 speed of this Sulfur team seems really impressive. And I don't know whether I'm reading into it too much. Um, and, you know, they've only played two games. Their opposition hasn't been the strongest. Um, and, you know, that, that they might face issues. I think they're going to get dominated in the forwards against against Wigan, against Huddersfield, probably, um, against Warrington, uh, etc. Uh, and we'll see how they go then. But at the moment, I think the most impressive thing about this Salford team is that they are winning this game through their backs, yeah. and that, and I think that's quite similar to what happened in their in their grand final run a few seasons ago. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And it's really, really interesting to see. We'll see what if their forwards can sort of, you know, become a solid pack um, as they face the bigger teams. But that's going to be the key factor in how far they can actually go. Yeah, definitely, and. Um... You mentioned Wigan briefly and you're really excited and looking forward to seeing how, how they can move on. A certain player has stood out massively for them so far this season and it was horrible for him to, the way the last year went, picking up his injury and being out for the rest of the year. But this this week's player of the round fully deserves it. I'll just read his stat line and those of, that are listening and watching before the graphic comes up, you're not going to know, you might, you might figure out who it is already. Two games, four tries, five tackles. Not great defence. Doesn't need to do a lot defensively. He's missed one tackle. So he's attempted six, missed one tackle. Fair enough. Not not great, not fantastic. Sort of a bit low. Nine tackle busts in 35 carries. Of five of those tackle busts, they're clean breaks. He's carried the ball 35 times. No, no one else in the league has carried more times. No one else in the league has made more than more metres than him. 75 metres more than than anyone else over two games. He's averaging 12 metres a carry and he scores a fantastic hat-trick at the weekend. Player of the round this week is Wigan Warriors fullback Jai Field. Um, he's an absolute talent, isn't he? He's He could be ripping it up in the NRL, couldn't he still? He should have been... I don't see why. Yeah. It was a huge coup when they brought him. Unlucky to lose him last year. And do you think the fact they didn't have him last year paid out to some of their... Like errors, maybe some of their their sort of misdemeanors last year. Yeah, I mean he was third choice behind Dylan Brown and Mitchell Moses, and I think very you know that's a very good combination to be third choice behind, but also hmm. a combination that doesn't often get injured. Um, you know, a combination that you're not going to get much chance to go to. He's come to you know he's come to again, and the injury was horrendous, but he's really shown um fantastic awareness um. The fact that he's been playing fullback um, as a five foot nine, you know, a five foot nine agile half to be able to play fullback and produce the quality of tries that he has been able to produce, you know, you think that it kind of doesn't feel like they're missing Bevan French, um, Bevan French's speed and skill when they've got Jai Field playing there. It's been really good to see. Um, I'm yeah, I'm excited um, by him. I'm excited. The season, I thought that with his injury, the um, he was becoming the sort of second favourite half behind Cade Cust. I think there's genuinely he is their marquee player mm. uh, now. Like he, like, and they've shown that that you know Jai Field is the is the leader of this team in terms of the production. Maybe yeah. not. I don't know on field voices, but in terms of who's going to be creating, who's going to be creating line breaks and tackle busts etc I think Jai Field's going to be that guy this season if he stays fit um, and I, I mean I can't I can't quite remember but who our player of the round was from round one uh, um, Cameron Smith was our, our player of the round from round one despite the fact that Leeds lost he was he was absolutely outstanding so we know for a fact that Cameron Smith and, and Jai Field are going to be in our um, team of the team of the month in two, in two weeks time or even next weekend depending on how, how we fit in but we know that our team of the month is going to have Joe Field and Cameron Smith in it as well. So 
fantastic players, very very well deserved in of, of how they are. But he's top of the man. He's got he's got three this week and two banana steel points from from week one, and he looks to be on the up. Quick question for you though, Bevan French. You got Jai Field at fullback. You got Hardacre on one wing. You've got um, who's there, and then you've got Kai Pierce Paul in the centres as well. Does he does he fit in Bevan French? Does he he has to fit in, doesn't he? Yeah, to me, French is probably a better tackler at fullback. Although I don't want to say that too <laughs> with too strong an opinion. Um, you know, especially the fact he's coming back from an injury, but. I would think that maybe Luluai takes him yeah. uh, and allow each other to sort of produce really confident performances um, and then allow a spine plus feel French um, with Hardacre plus PS4 at the centre. Um, maybe PS4 plays him Thornley um, after that. Yeah. But um, so I think that, yeah, I think there's a little bit of room to wiggle about I think it's an incredible it's been an incredible call from Matt Pete as well because if I, I tell you, if I was a Wigan coach I would be putting Zach Hardacre at full back and, would, and we probably wouldn't have won two from two so no, there's, yeah, exactly. there's, a reason I'm, there's a reason I'm not the coach but it's um, yeah I think it's a brave call not to put a Super League winning full back at full back uh, and it's really paying off um, and it's really it's looking like Wigan could play as well as they did under Sean Wayne for all those years uh, at the moment so it's positive to see very yeah. positive yeah very very positive and congratulations to, to Jai Field and touch wood he stays injury free this year and continues to rip it up for Wigan because he's such an exciting player and, and he brings such, such such energy and such belief to that Wigan team and to the Wigan fans as well but we must we must move on it's it's Hall of Fame time it's same as last week. We we didn't have one last week, and I decided that we would this this man des- deserved to be in the Hall of Fame, and people listening and watching you'll you'll understand why. It's it's Johnny Whiteley MBE the the the, M- the former rugby league footballer coach, entire club career with Hull FC, arguably one of the best players in the world, a World Cup winner in nineteen fifty four and and nineteen sixty. Over four hundred appearances, one hundred and fifty six tries, like just absolutely fantastic. He was in, inducted into the Rugby League Hall of Fame in two thousand and eighteen. Just an absolutely, just a really nice man as well. He he ran a working men's club in West Hull. He later set up West Hull Amateur Rugby League Club. New services to rugby league. MB was awarded in two thousand and six. An honorary degree from Hull University in two thousand and twelve, but unfortunately. Eight days ago, the 13th of February 2022, he passed away at the age of 91. And the man was so well loved, so well respected. One of England's greatest ever players. And if you were to pick a 1 to 13 of English players, the second row and loose forward, we've got such a talent, but you've got to put him in there. He doesn't. You don't win the World Cup twice if you're not an absolutely outstanding player. And that's why Johnny Whiteley sort of deserves to be in our Hall of Fame and any Hall of Fame in the world. And the fact that he was a one club man, played 15 times for Great Britain, only made one England cap, which it's really weird for me because it seems we only, we sort of turned into Great Britain from 54 onwards and then England didn't really get a look in. But coached Great Britain 19 times, great coached England three times, was a Yorkshire coach for a while fantastic just a well loved man really nice man and he fully deserves to go in there and I don't see why I don't see any arguments there a really serious one this, this week obviously yeah it's, it's, I mean you've done him all the all the credit he deserves interestingly enough the 1954 World Cup that he won with Great Britain uh, he won with Great Britain it was the only World Cup final not to involve Australia in the history of the Rugby League World Cup, so there's a lovely bit of trivia, um, nice to sort of be, to sort of be added on to there as well. Um, so, but he, yeah, he you know he so he, he won the World Cup against France, in won the World Cup against Australia. He's um, he had a brilliant career. Um, you know he I think you can tell by how fondly remembering he's 
week by Paul since mm. uh, his sad passing that, um, that that he was one of the greats. I'm not, so I didn't know too much about him. Obviously, he's uh, he's a couple of years before my time <laughs> in terms of when his playing days were, and uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, he gave back to the game through coaching as well. Um, yeah, he did. Yeah, and a rugby league man through and through, and uh, the kind of player that obviously I think every English forward should aspire to be. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, and just a man that everyone needs to look up to, especially those that potentially want to leave a club for more money. Like he stayed at Hull for free and decided that he was going to pl- carry on playing and did such a fantastic job for the for the black and whites over the over in Hull and just fully deserves his spot in our Hall of Fame, the Rugby Football League Hall of Fame, and, and any Hall of Fame he he gets into at any point in the future. Um, so rest in peace to Johnny Whiteley and. Thank you for everything you've done for the sport. Challenge Cup time though now. And it's round five, I believe, this weekend. I think round four, round round four this weekend. And we've got some absolute cracking fixtures. An absolute cracking fixtures lined up. But I think there's two teams we need to speak about more than anything. The Royal Navy and Hunslet Club Parkside. Hunslet Club Parkside overcame London Scholars in the last round quite comfortably so to beat a league one side for them and then to now go and face Sheffield Eagles at home I believe there's still no confirmed kickoff time or date for that this weekend so we'll keep an eye out for that hopefully that comes out over the next few days and then the Royal Navy their success their their reward for getting as far as they have is an away game against Batley Bulldogs who seem to be flying flying high in the championship so far this season They've, they've done fantastic justice. And do you see either of those teams, probably more so Hunslet Club Parkside, overcoming um, Sheffield? Do you think they can maybe make the next round? I think this is the point where I stop talking. Yeah, where I, I, I would stop believing in the amateur side. <laughs> um, sadly. Uh, I think that it really shouldn't be played down, though, how incredible it is for these teams in the toughest year to even qualify for the Challenge Cup (laughs) to make it through to the fourth round uh, to get games against championship clubs Um, you know this is this is as good as it gets if you're an amateur side or a representative side really yeah this is sort of the sort of the most you could hope for and you know I, I think Batley on their slope Will will we'll almost definitely handle the Royal Navy, um, hands up Club Parkside and Sheffield. There's a chance that Sheffield want to rest players and focus on the league. I would highly doubt it, but there is a chance. Like, um, and then I guess you don't know what could happen. Um, but I think it's being played at the uh, South Leeds Stadium as well. So uh, hands up, give hands up, uh, RLFC giving up their ground for it to be played at. So it'll be played on a good pitch, but a pitch that. Parkside are perhaps unfamiliar with, so a lot of factors sort of which I could, I could suggest, but I don't think that it'll be um, too big an issue for uh, for Sheffield. Um, but it really is incredible that we got two amateur sides in, into this fourth round, um, yeah. and on the route got two League One sides not helped by amateur sides. So really fantastic. Yeah, really, really good news, and congratulations to those two teams. Your team, your your you've got boys in the in the next round of the Challenge Cup as well. North Wales Crusaders are, are in there. Are they are they going to be in the next round? Do you think, or is that sort of is that maybe asking a little bit too much? They've got to play Hunslet at home in the next round. Well, it's um, if they were at home, home there's a good chance that North Wales Crusaders, with the form they've been playing with uh, in the previous two rounds of the Challenge Cup could have made it to the uh could have could have made it past Hunslet. However, this game's being played in the Wirral as there were as the Welsh Rugby Union blocked the playing um of rugby league on areas for this weekend um upcoming. Um and that is unfortunate. Um it means that it's technically a neutral site. Yeah. Um that the game's being played on and I think Hunslet have already perhaps beat Keithley 
Um, not that North Wales beating Swinton isn't a, a big win, but I just think that, um, you know, I think it's sort of factors are sort of working against North Wales, which is a home game away from home. Um, it probably won't feel right. The atmosphere probably won't be quite the same. It'll be sort of like an away game for them. Um, yeah. But we'll see. I think they've definitely got the quality to overcome it. And I'm being quite cynical because I've been let down by Crusaders many times in the past. <laughs> but it's, um, I, I, you know, sadly, it's sort of a, yeah, it's uh, not quite uh, a home game for the Crusaders. And I just think that that sort of fact is working against them, um, which could sort of affect their mindset going into the game. Yeah, that's totally that's totally understandable. We've got um, some cracking all championship ties lined up as well. They seem to throw these together perfectly. You've got York City Knights versus Newcastle, two teams that mo- that both the two most recent teams, other than last season, like two teams that are in the championship, having won League One recent, like in in the last five seasons. They're looking at Super League places within the next five years. They're developing their teams. They're at nice stadiums. They've got really good coaching facilities. They've got they've got youngsters coming through their academies. They play on they play on Sunday. It's a game that we, I was looking to get to, but unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get there. Featherstone versus Halifax. You've got a playoff repeat, playoff semi final repeat um, on Sunday as well. Lee versus Widnes on Monday night live on Premier Sports. Bradford Bulls travel down to a really disappointing London side so far this year. And then you've got Dewsbury Rams at Workington. Five all championship ties where I don't know if I can really see a winner in a lot of these. I think Bradford London is probably quite obvious. Featherstone over Fax looks like it could be quite obvious, but there's always been close games between the sides or apart from the final last year, there was the games between the sides that Fax could turn up on the day. It's a different team, different teams for both both lot of Fev going to focus on promotion this year. They're going to potentially rest players. Are York and Newcastle going to put full strength teams out? Lee and Witness are both pushing for promotion. So, uh, like, where do these teams sit? Because it's so difficult for these top level championship sides because they don't want to risk these players getting injured. But a win against a fellow championship side is so crucial for for them in the league as well, isn't it? In terms of their form and when they meet later in the season. Yeah, I mean, but it, this is kind of like a, an, another championship game for them. Uh, if you you know, and you sort of treat it as a I guess you sort of treat it as the, a league game that won't go onto the onto the table, but proof of sort of where your standard is. If you beat a mm. team who want, you know, if Fax beat Bresden, for example, all of a sudden, yeah, the whole system become beatable. Um, yeah, and things like that. what makes me a bit sad about this draw is that Lee and Widnes are both teams I'd like to see take on sort of the lower end of Super League opposition. Yeah. Fax and Fenton, both teams I'd like to see take on the lower end of Super League opposition. Yeah. Uh, and it, and they are all sort of knocking each other out um, by the looks of it. So Yeah, and we've only got five ties in the next round. So there's only going to be five of these teams in the, in the sixth round when the Super League teams come in. So arguably you could get only one of these teams facing a Super League side, which is a little bit unfair in, in terms of that at the end of March as well. Yeah, and I know obviously, you know, even if it was a bigger draw and things, you could, there's still just as much chance of this happening. But in terms of a draw, it just it it pains me how set up it is for a team who finishes in the top eight to win it. <laughs> like, there's no the, the amount of room for upset is at an absolute minimum. Yeah, and I think we will talk about this when when we do our Challenge Cup final special because it's the only game on that weekend, so there won't be loads of rugby to talk about. We will talk about how we think as a, as a trio we sh- the, the Challenge Cup might need a little bit of restructuring obviously the pandemic has taken a little bit of a hit to that and we might they, that might just be this season and hopefully next season it will change but the fact that we've had rounds where we've only had six games or five games and even round six we've only got eight games like that so it's a little bit 16 teams it, it's not a lot really like you've got five Five teams there and then eleven Super League sides because we don't have to lose in the competition either. Like no to lose and Cornwall aren't in the competition, so you're missing a two of your professional teams. Uh, if you include Cornwall to that, they've only they've now got I think double figures in terms of their player count. So slowly but surely they're going to have a seventeen man squad come March when when um, in six weeks time when when League One starts. 
Don't drink, don't drink them. No, don't. Uh, t- touch wood. Corn will have a full team come the middle of March. They might. I mean, they might already. They might just not have announced them. So, um, who knows? One of the other games that takes place this weekend: Doncaster versus Whitehaven. League One versus Championship. Doncaster at home. Could you see? Could you see there being a League One side in the next round, or do you think it's going to be these Championship sides? Yeah, I mean, there's. I mean, the other sort of tie between League One Championship is Rochdale Barrow. Yeah. Um. I so and I think, I mean, Barrow have been absolutely flying. Yeah. Um. But Rochdale are at home as well, so I think that um this is actually a great indicator to show us the sort of talent gap that is between. Um, because part of me believes that sort of your bottom half of the championship is very comparable to your top five teams in League One, um, and it you know it I think it's nice it'll be nice to see. Um, I, I I want the best team to win at the end of the day, and I want them to go and put on a Super League team in the future. So um, I think there's no reason why a League One side couldn't beat a champion a championship side unless it was Featherstone, Lee Widness. Um yeah. but I you know the you know the odds are strong in the championship team table I think. Well you know, I'm I don't see why it's not a possibility. Yeah, even with those five all championship sides, it looks like we're gonna get a it looks like we're gonna have quite a few championship teams in the next round and fair play to them. If, if, it's a nice it's nice to have those re- those games now but the fact that we're not likely to see a lot of them come the Super League team entry in, in two rounds time is a little bit disappointing but like we said we'll get into that later in the season wow. and when the Challenge Cup final comes around and we can really dig deep into where we think we need to improve the Challenge Cup and just sort of the final note on that is that these championship sides have just been playing in mud baths where yeah. injury pitches uh, probably got a few players carrying knots whilst there's been a nice beat up on the sofa and watch the rain at your back window from a uh, for the League One side, so yeah, mm. it potentially that could be a big factor in you know fatigue, and it could be a big factor as well going into these ties. So there's every chance of there being an upset. Um, sadly, none of the League One versus Championship games have been streamed on, a, well at least broadcast. They might have been streamed, but they won't be being broadcast. So no, I believe the th- the three games that we have on the television this weekend. On BBC Sport, they continue their coverage. It'll be the Royal Navy versus uh, Batley at the Foskis Bixit Stadium. That'll be a 1pm kickoff. That'll be followed by the 3pm by the Sportsman's coverage of York City Knights versus Newcastle. Then on Monday, Premier Sports um, will show um, their first Challenge Cup tie of the season between Lee and Widnes. Three ties, no our league fixture this weekend. Really surprising. The RFL own the rights to this competition. We could have had four games on this weekend. Um, do you think it would have been a bit of a push to have four games on a weekend? Because there's no game on Sunday. Uh, sorry, there's no game on Saturday this weekend being being pub, pub, um, being shown. Could you could they have snuck a game on Saturday for our league? I, I think they should have at this stage where there's so many, you know, where there is ties that I think are definitely worth watching. Um, you know, I, I don't see why they couldn't have. I would have concerns about how many people have to tune into the league. Yeah. Um, I think if this is the RFL's way of sort of saying that, that it as a streaming platform maybe need to look at, um, then I wouldn't be too concerned as long as they stay dedicated to getting as much rugby league on TV um, or on to a streaming platform, then I wouldn't be too concerned. But yeah, there's something about our league, I think it's you personally um, you know I hate the hard camera only angles yeah. Um, there's yeah there's I think there's some work that, to be done um, so I'm not too upset cause it's something where I would struggle to tune into it properly um, if it was on anyway um, and yeah. the other three we've got here are, are much easier to watch in my opinion so just things I'm more familiar with um, but also things I can get on more devices and things like that so I'm not sort of. I, I I think that the picture selection leaves a lot for me to, to be desired for me in terms of you know why aren't we seeing hundred club park in the chair? Why aren't we seeing Rochdale Barrow? Yeah. Um, 
but I guess I guess I won't complain too much. <laughs> he says he says after a little bit of a complaint, um, but no, I get you. Um, one thing we're we're looking forward to though, and it's not Northern Hemisphere Rugby League this weekend. It's time for your not the watch NRL NRL watch. Before you go into what your story is, we had trial games this weekend, um, and a story that stood out for me was Hayes Dunster will be out for the season after rupturing his ACL, his MCL, and his PCL after a tackle from uh, Falmuina, I believe it is. I think that's how you say it. Not it's, it's a hip. It was a hip drop tackle, which the NRL are cracking down on, and we watched it back yesterday, and we thought it wasn't it wasn't horrible looking, and it happens all the time. But the reason they're cracking down is because of these injuries. But a little bit of a side note: Hayes Dunster is dating family and his sister. A little bit of a joke question. Do you think that was a bit of leave my sister alone? <laughs> <laughs> if it was, then uh, I mean it's. An absolutely disgusting play for a <laughs> I was actually when I first see the tackle, I find it very hard in re- in the sort of real time from the hard camera. Yeah. To note it as even being a a, a hip drop. Um, yeah. And it gets a point, you know, it's you get your angle wrong on a low tackle now, and all of a sudden it's a hip drop tackle, and you, yeah, I mean, obviously you can see what comes from it but now we're inventing ways of tackling low from the front we're well, not inventing but we've defined ways of tackling low at the front which is the best way to make a one-on-one tackle and get your man to the ground in a one-on-one tackle yeah we're now saying that if you if you get even slightly if you get a wrong angle on that and you fall onto their legs yeah how you're you could be out for three games yeah it... which it's hard. It's hard because I understand how it's dangerous, and I'm sure when you know cannonball tackles were first um, sort of banned, that there was the same sort of argument of well, how else are we supposed to get the guys to the ground with a third man going in, mm. or things like this. So I'm sure you know. I'm sure it's something to play and crack down on, but it's kind of go. If we go back to when Robin was talking about head injuries mm. and now it's like well what's even the point in trying to bring your guy to the ground around the waist you may as well go around his you know chest and shoulders and then we're yeah. going to end up with concussion injuries so mm. it's really it seems like there's no solution to safe tackling um, and it's made me a little bit I don't know it makes me worry a little bit in terms of how many different tackle techniques in in, in terms of not high that aren't high you know aren't around the head yeah as you can to ban until you've run out of tackle, tackle technique. Yeah, because um, the crush has been banned, the hip drop tackle has been banned, uh, the shoulder charge has been banned, which, if done correctly, isn't dangerous. <laughs> like these tackles, if done properly, will not hurt people. Um, oh well, maybe the the crusher will because of the pressure that it puts on the neck and and the injuries that 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 could potentially cause. But the hip drop, if it's done people if you've got two hands on a man you can put your foot in front of him and you can whip him over your leg that's that's only going to injure someone if the if the player's foot's caught in the ground that's not the necessarily the tackler's fault it we need to keep an eye on on player safety i 100 percent agree player safety is the priority and it's the key but like you said if you're going to ban four or five tackle techniques it's going to be end up being like touch rugby and that's when a lot of people will start falling out of love with the game and but maybe that's what we need to do to get kids back in love with the game. We'll, we'll only find out once once it's all come through. But we do need to talk about some positive NRL news. Take it away. Yeah, so although the, uh, the NRL will still be in its pre-season uh, games before it comes back to us on March 10th, um, we do get the NRLW. Um, on our TV uh, this weekend. There is three games all being played uh, in the early hours of February 27th morning. I think that's the Saturday Uh, morning. Yeah. So you've got... Sunday morning. uh, 
we've got the St. George Illawarra Dragons against the Gold Coast Titans. The Sydney Roosters versus the Brisbane Bron Broncos in the 2020 or the last grand final um, rematch. And the Newcastle Knights against Parramatta Real. Um, so, you know, so sort of the pinnacle of uh, women's rugby league, a very strong competition. You compare it, you know, it hasn't got the sort of, you look at how many women's teams we have are sort of competing in the top tier of um, England. They've decided not to do that in uh, Australia and to really focus on getting mm -hmm. six really strong teams um, uh, before they sort of look into expansion. And it's yeah, it should be it should be an interesting uh, start to the week. I mean, if you just quickly go through the history of the NRLW, there has been three grand finals. Brisbane have won all three of them. Uh, Sydney Roosters have been runners up in 2018, wooden spoon holders in 2019, and runners up in 2020. So, so it looks it looks like they're going to be absolutely battered by the Broncos this weekend. Then, if, if we're going on going on form, but we can have a chat about that in in about 10 15 minutes time, I guess. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Maybe less absolutely. than probably less than that. Mm. But no, really interesting. I, I'm a fan of like the State of Origin when that was on when the, they brought the Women's State of Origin in and they did it as a the same weekends the same night so you had the women's game swiftly followed by the men's game and the world the women the, all the world cups going to be played together this year you've got the men's final and the women's final on the same night at old trafford that's going to be absolutely outstanding no doubt we'll see two australian teams with lift the trophy um but who cares if you're watching top quality rugby league i like the fact that they've gone for six quality teams over 16 mediocre teams um maybe it's something that the rfl can sort of follow up they've i don't know they've extended the wheelchair super league this year to have a team from london and some some of the other teams have been promoted and and the women's super league the way that they've brought in the south and the way they've got the south um now instead of having east and west that we're going to be playing all across the country i mean we've got trips to cornwall and cardiff coming up in the summer which they're going to be hell of a weekend sort of, well, not even a weekend, just a day travelling. We're going to probably have to go down the night before, play the game and come back for those. They're going to be f hella fixtures, but it's good to see that the NRLW have, have sort of narrowed it down so there's not as much travelling, there's not as many teams to play for, and the the odds of finishing, like you said, two, runner, two runners-up medals and then a wooden spoon for, for Sydney Roosters in three seasons, and they've all had a year off as well, so the number of players that they have that want to play might have increased as well. So really, really good news for the NRL. Did you, are, are you looking forward to any of the, the, the main the sort of games coming up? I know you're a massive Canberra Raiders fan. Did, did their trial go well? Did you manage to catch any of their trial? I've seen a little bit of highlights which have sort of confer almost confirmed that Xavier Savage will be starting fullback in Charles yeah. against the centres. Yeah. Um, something that's quite exciting but also a little bit it seems like it's taken a bit of a priority off defense with Canberra but um, you know we'll we'll see how that goes and it's quite exciting to see sort of a uh, young player come through there I saw that Kalen Ponga got smashed by some young uh, bulldog winger <laughs> um, which was which was which was quite an entertaining clip but yeah, other than that you know they, at the end of the day they are friendlies um, a lot of the players who sort of play or start won't won't play for a few weeks into the season or until injuries hit or until rotation, just origin rotation comes about. So I don't think it's something where I pay too much attention to, um, you know, bring on the actual NRL. Yeah, bring on the actual NRL. Talking of sort of bring on the NRL, we will have an NRLW game to predict in our set of six coming up. But before we get into our set of six, it's been two weeks. We've got a bad rating. So far, Vancouver Dragons have had a 5.5. .5. Philadelphia Fight have had a 6. Uh, Castlecon got a 7.5, so they're sitting middle of the table. York Acon got an 8, and Dorkal Tigers got an 8.5. This week, though, Toby, we're, we're going to Europe. We're back in Europe. We're back in a team that's going to... We're back in a country that's going to be at the World Cup this year. We're in Greece. We've gone for the Attica, the Attica Rhinos 13. You've got the badge in front of you. Those that are watching can see the badge there as well. Thoughts? You've had two. You've had you've had you've had a week to look at this. Yeah, well, they, they they've gone for what I would call the most classic rugby league badge design, um, in terms of the shape and the sort of use of chevrons, um, 
I think the green and yellow colour, um, well, it's green and yellow, which all sort, of, sort of screams Australia, and then they've planted some black over at the top to make it not Australia. Um, I'm not quite sure the rhino on top of the yellow chevrons works for me, but it's a very angry rhino. Uh, you know, it looks fierce. Uh, you know, it looks like it's going to drive fear into the hearts of its opponents. Um, I don't. Apart from that color scheme, I'm quite, I'm quite a fan. You know, I think that I'd be proud to get behind a team called the Rhinos as long as they're not Leeds Rhinos. Um, <laughs> well, that's a bit mean. I'm sorry to any Rhinos. No, there, no, but... no, no. Back it. You've said it now. You've got to back it up. You can't, you can't backtrack on it. I, uh, you know, I, so I, I like the Rhinos all blacked out. I, I wonder if they sort of how they approach the kit. If they go for a green and yellow kit, or if they go for like an old, mm. like a more, you know, blacked out number type thing. But, um, I guess that's some. I, I think that it gives them some possibilities in the creative department if they ever become a Super League team. You know, <laughs> fifty years down the line. So, Say fifteen or fifty. Fifteen. Five zero. Five zero. Yeah. In twenty seventy two, when the Attica Rangers get promoted to Super League, um, I think yeah. So it's not it's not too bad. Um, but I'm not a fan of how it's effectively an Australian template. The, the ARL template almost with a blacked out Leeds Rhino put over the top. I think it's a little bit lazy on the creative side, although at the same time, I do like how fierce the Rhino looks. So I'm going to go for a seven. A seven. Oh, nice. It's in fourth place. So I'll tell you what, the Philadelphia fight and the Vancouver Dragons have been shafted here. Um, I thought the Philadelphia fight was better than, than what you thought. You, stood, you sat there and laughed at it and me and Robin thought it was actually not that bad. But fair enough, a seven for Attica Rhinos. They're on the leaderboard. We've got six teams now. So give it a couple more weeks and we'll have a graphic put up and we'll add the graphic in every week. We'll um, we'll throw it in. But it's time for the most important important round of the... Well, most important segment of, of the show. You and me, after last week's fixtures, we're, we're level on points when it comes to the set of six. The Bradford Barrow game was postponed, so everyone got a half point E, which means we're all back on whole integers. Right now, we're back on integers. Um, I was five from five for the rest for all the other games, and I reckon I'd have been six from six this week, so I'm happy for that. You and me are both on 22. Robin is three points behind on 19. We don't know Robin's predictions yet, so as soon as he gets those in, at the time of recording, we don't know Robin's predictions yet. Hopefully, before Thursday night, he'll give them to us, and, and we'll have them up on onto social media you were well happy last week you thought you were going to be running away with it but I've clawed you back are you are you still confident you can win this come the end of the season yeah you know I think I got a bit of, I think I got a bit of um, <laughs> luck at the beginning of the season which to continue my uh, my anti leads you know <laughs> got more luck I got more luck than leads at the start of their season mm. so you know you know, I got a bit of luck at the beginning of the season and now we're starting now I'm starting to have to pick smart now because I started to try and pick up cheeky little yeah, uh, cheeky little points here and there and now I need to start maybe picking <laughs> with my head again so watch the camera drop but yeah picking with my head again um, so let's see what is good about it is that it proves that Robin isn't that isn't just a genius when it comes to predictions as we thought he might have been last season well, I think last season you and me were just messing around I think we just sort of went with we sort of were hoping we'd get a few shocks and we let we always sort of let him go first then we're like we're so far behind we've got to go for we started sort of panicking towards the end having to go for different points in order to in order to get the win but he played sensible and, and we had to we had to play risky high risk high reward first up though one win between them in, over the first two rounds Catalan travelled to Leeds who haven't won yet this season do you think Leeds will get a, get their first two points on the board or Catalan only just overcame a Wakefield side that we we thought weren't going to be as as good. But like you said, it's the start of the season. Players are still getting used to some of these new rules. The scrums are back. I don't know. I I think I'll let you go first on this one, and then I'll, I'll take the next one because I'm I'm still not really sure. Yeah, I think it's hard because obviously Catalan quite you know we've talked about their sort of deficiencies in the pack after the first week. <laughs> um, they had to fight hard for their win against Wakefield. I just think that Leeds are going to get off to a bad start to the season. They haven't got 
the quality in the back. They've only got sort of Ash Hanley fit in terms of their their main sort of starting back five. Um, and I just think that it's a little bit. Um, it's. I, I just think that it's. They're going to grow into the season, and it's not going to be this game where they sort of turn their fortunes around. I do still think that Leeds are going to be a top six, top half, top a playoff side. But I think that right for right now, this is just sort of they're going to have a rough start to the season again. Um, and I'm going to go with Catalan. Well, one of us is going to be a point ahead of the other after the first game of the weekend because I think the the forward deficiencies of Catalan, the fact that they weren't outstanding against Wakefield, the fact that they've they only just won, they got arguably battered by St Helens that that first week, which shouldn't have happened. Leeds, yes, they've not won a game, but they haven't played badly. They played really well against Warrington, um, despite being a man down. This weekend was a little bit more disappointing, but we've seen that Wigan are, are a much better side than what we believe they might have been. Uh, and for that reason, they're at home on a on a night in front of the cameras. Headingley's going to be packed. There won't be many f- um, fans from the south of France at Headingley. I think the, the fact they're going to have the fans behind them, I think this is Leeds' time to get two points from the board and show us just what they can deliver, deliver us for this season. And I think... Both these teams in our next game are going to have to do the same thing. Two teams that are winless so far this year, Hull KR versus Castleford. I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Hull KR on this one. There, neither teams impressed me massively this season, but I don't. I I think. Yeah, I just think Hull KR have got that little bit about them. They know it's the team's really similar. They've not had many chops and changes. They know what it takes to kick themselves up and and just pick themselves up on the floor and and do what they need to do. Jordan Abdul's being quite consistent still. Lockman Coote unfortunately is out injured for them, but they, 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 I think they're just going to do enough at home to overcome Lee Radford's side this weekend. And I don't know if you agree with me, but Radford's got a lot of work to do to to put Cass back in the top half. Yeah, the to- the Tony Smith factor. I think you know he know his team's had a couple of bad games, and he I bet he's identified exactly where it is, and his team all know, and they're already working to correct those errors, and they're already ducked his life without Lachlan Coote Coot for the sort of short term. You know, I do think that things point towards Hull KR, but in terms of personnel, I think Castleford are looking a little bit stronger going into this game. Um, just it depends what they do with sort of. Their, their halves combination um, you know if Jake Truman's not playing well and uh, Danny Richardson's not fit is there sort of room for maybe Callum McClellan to play mm. um, this game and could that be something that impacts the, impacts the result um, I, I'm going to take Castleford just because I think I think I like what they might be capable of more than what we've seen Hull KR be capable of um, I think and it's sort of a very on a whim but it's something where I just wonder if Hull KR have, have, have lost that little bit of depth that made them sort of so strong last year and they've gone all eggs in the basket and, making this, and maybe it's starting to to look like they, you know, they're not able to sort of pull players out of their positions and move players around and it's very much a set team they have to play and if and if that's not functioning properly I'm not sure how many options they have to around it so I'll take Castle just so I think they're more adaptable um, in the immediate to be able to sort of get their first win of the season here yeah definitely I, I totally agree Broncos versus Roosters NRLW we mentioned it you said the Roosters had made two grand finals in three years, but in that second year, they were wooden spoon winners. Broncos, is it? Have they made the grand final every year, or have they sort of been there? Yeah, they've won it. They've they've won it every year. So, for me, this is this is dead rubber. I know it's first game of the season, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go with the Broncos here. I, I don't know a lot about the NRLW, but just on that alone, the fact that they've got three wins, they've beaten the Roosters twice in two grand finals. But both teams have had a year off, so that that could be a massive contributing factor. But like we said, we don't know a lot. It's round one, but for me, I think it's probably the only time I'll pick the Brisbane Broncos to win this year. 
you know what? That was gonna be my exact dog. <laughs> I, it, we might never be able to pick Brisbane Broncos to win for the rest of the year, so I'm going to pick them in this game. Yeah, hundred um, percent. It's like I said, we we hope that it's a quality game, and we hope that that the Broncos can do a little bit more in terms of the NRL on the men's side. But this women's team looks really strong over the last, well, over the first three NRLW seasons, and I don't see why there's a reason they can't do it again, unless loads of players seem to suddenly seem to have left and maybe gone to like Gold Coast or something else. But we move, we've got to move on to Challenge Cup games now. Uh, it's our first televised fixture of the weekend. Batley at home against the Navy. You've already sort of mentioned, I think this. you said this is the time where the the amateur sides or the community level sides are done. This is as far as they're going to get. And I have to believe you, Like I have to back you on this one. Batley are a, a strong championship side. They're not a low level or a mid-table League One side that are playing away from home and having to travel a long way. They're at home on a night on a pitch that they're comfortable with. It's a long journey for the Navy from Portsmouth. Bat- Batley are going to probably come away with this one quite comfortably, aren't they? Yeah, on the ski slopes that is Batley's pitch. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. You know, the Navy are built for water. They're not built for, for snow. <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm going to say there. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what you're saying either. Yeah. yeah I'm just, a huge home um, advantage for for Batley. Um, they're miles above um, the Navy in terms of personnel. You know that I think Batley are as close to professional as you can be without actually being for a professional mm. outfit. I think. Yeah, very close. Um, so, um, yeah. So yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Next up is our next um, community level side, Hunslet Club Park side. At home, you like me. At home, they're at the South East Stadium in Hunslet against the Sheffield Eagles. Huge game for Club Park side. Like you said, they've just come off off the back of a massive win over London Scholars. Their tails would be up. They're a really strong um, side in terms of the sort of level they're at. Do you think this is a shock? Do you think Sheffield could maybe focus on the league, or do you think they're they're going to want a little bit of a cut run maybe to get their season going? Do you think? Where are you going on this one? Yeah, I think if you look at what Club Parkside beat the Scholars by 22 points, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, and that's the Scholars side that we've talked about how awful they are. You know, they they, they may as well be an amateur side. And um, I think that, you know, Sheffield will probably rack up about 60 against that Scholars team. Um, so I think that you know I think I will be sticking with Sheffield here. I think that that sort of knocking out a League One point isn't sort of too much to be um, to be looked at when you know it's much nowhere near the sort of standard that we've got playing that we're going to do. So to be no. off, I don't think. No, nowhere near it. And yeah, I, I think that it, I think that Sheffield will sort of comfortably win, but there is also you know anything can happen, and you know if. This is the one which, if you, ask, if you get any prediction wildly wrong, I'd want it to be this one. I think. So. Yeah, I think these two games that we've just mentioned. If you want, if you wanted to get any wrong, it's going to be these two. You'd you'd love to see the Navy and Hunslet Club Parkside playing in the next round and potentially even against each other. So then you're guaranteed one in, against the Super League or in the same draw as a Super League team. Like these two teams win this weekend, they play each other in the next round. And protect, like, imagine they get, like, St. Helens away. Like, you've got St. Helens playing at the bloody Navy down in Portsmouth in, in round six. It, it could happen, but it's a long, it's a long, it's a big ask for for these two teams to, to get that far. But it, I, I'll tell you what, it'll be in the back of some of their minds, and I'm sure, I'm sure the, comp, the club park side players will love it. I absolutely love it. Especially the Hunza club side. They'll, I bet they reckon they'd love a game against Cass. Paul McShane against his brother, come on, or Paul McShane against the club that he coaches. That it's it's Hollywood written stuff, man. It's it's movie it's movie stuff, fairy tale. But the last game of the weekend, it's probably the toughest game to pick um, in terms of the Challenge Cup. I know we said we've got Fairfax, we've got London Bradford, Witness Lee, but York City Knights against Newcastle Thunder at York at the Liner Stadium. Big big fixture. Yeah, do you know what? Um, it's in a very hard game to pick. I would say it's two sides which have been mm, relatively inconsistent at the start of the season. Um, here, you know, York managed to hold Lee to what, a very tight first half last yeah. weekend and lost 
lost it in the second. Um, you know, two teams which have both got two wins and two losses. Um, it, yeah, it's an incredibly cl- close game. I'm going to pick Newcastle because I did say that Newcastle were going to be like fourth this season. <laughs> you did. And if they're going to they're gonna start getting to anywhere near fourth, which I mean, they're currently sixth. But you know they're still they're behind Barrow currently, so if they're going to get yeah. in, start putting in good performance week after week, and hopefully you know for the sake of my, you know me not looking like a complete idiot, um, <laughs> maybe it can start sort of this weekend. So I'm going to go with Newcastle. And for that note, I'm going to go for York. So we're three equal fixtures between me and you, three separate ones. If I'd have gone to the game, I'd have been supporting York, no, no doubt. I would have wanted York to win. It's at their home ground. They're at the London Stadium. It's going to be horrible weather. Whether people will travel from Newcastle to York because of the weather that we're having, it, it's a totally different question. But I think it's going to be an absolute cracking fixture. And I, I can't wait. That's just a shame that we can't, that, that we can't make it uh, due to just the, the cost of trains. And th- that's a totally different story. But that's a story we'll have, a uh, chat we'll have off, off camera. But yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for York this one. I, I really like the way they played against Lee in the first half the other week. I think that they they can turn it around and I think they will turn their, their sort of inconsistencies around and this is this is the chance for them to do that against a team that I see as quite level to them. So I've, I'm going to go for York this one. Unfortunately, like I said, Robin hasn't quite got his fixtures in yet, but I'm sure he'll get them to us and you'll see them posted up on, on social media over the next... Um, well, I hope they'll be up by the time the po- the podcast is out. If not, they'll be out a few hours after the podcast has been released. Um, but yeah, it, it's been it's been a busy two weeks. We've had a lot to catch up on. Hopefully, next week won't be half as busy. We'll only have Challenge Cup and Super League fixtures to really talk about. Um, I believe it is back to you for the Hall of Fame next week, Toby. I believe, or is it Robin's Hall of Fame next week? Thurston, yeah, Thurston Whiteley, and now it's Robin. Yeah, so now it's um, it's it's Robin's turn. So Robin should be back next week. Once again, apologies that he could not be here tonight or couldn't be here this week. Good luck to him on his exams. Good luck to you this week, Toby, and whatever you're doing, uh, whether you're going to see Derby play or no, uh, <laughs> Millwall home tomorrow, and then I'm uh, what's it called? I'm and I'm back in uni and workplace as well so it's uh yeah changing of routine for me well um, so i do actually appreciate the luck <laughs> uh well congratulations to derby on their 2-1 victory uh last night against Millwall. that uh, that's <laughs> when this comes out 2-1 <laughs> if derby win 2-1 yeah. now magic mate absolutely magic um but no we'll catch you again same time next week Enjoy the rugby league that's on telly this weekend. There's plenty of it, whether it's NRL, NRLW, Challenge Cup, Super League. I've been Bradley. That's been Toby. Once again, Robin wasn't here. Apologies. We've been the Biff. Don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe. Just spread the word. We'll be here forever. We'll be here all season. And we can't wait to bring you lots more, sort of, maybe a little more, few more fiery discussions as the season goes on and we really get into some of the the deeper issues of, of the 2022 season but we've been the biff and we'll see you next week goodbye